So thanks everybody for coming out to the um, Apache Kafka NYC meetup. Uh, welcome to Datadog. Uh, have any, has anybody here heard of Datadog? Are there any Datadog customers out there? Yeah, a couple, cool. Uh, if you haven't heard of us before, uh, Datadog is a, uh, a hosted service for uh, infrastructure monitoring, application performance monitoring, and logs management. Uh, we help you monitor systems like Kafka or your web applications. Uh, we're also hiring engineers, uh, including those if you're, if you like working with Kafka, you know, we move trillions of data points per second, uh, trillions of data points per day through Kafka. Uh, if you're interested in figuring out how to reliably scale Kafka, uh, please come chat with me, chat with another, uh, Datadog employee. Uh, tonight we're going to hear from, uh, Stephen Dots and Mike Kaminsky from the New York Times about, uh, the publishing pipeline. Uh, and then we'll hear from Datadog's own Jamie Alkiza about how we do capacity planning for Kafka. So please welcome Stephen and Mike. So, uh, hello. <laughs> Thanks for coming out. Um, we're from downstairs and we get to see how the other half lives. Um, they have this nice view and we have the Port Authority. <laughs> so uh, this is our presentation, how to rewind the homepage and other things learned running Kafka as a service. I'm Mike Kaminsky. And I'm Steven Dots. So uh, let's get started. So the way that we run Kafka at the New York Times may be a bit different than the use case that um, some of you here may be used to. Um, we only have 41 million messages right now total, which makes up about a terabyte of storage, right? And we published the Kafka at about one message per second. And that scales with about as fast as people can write content, right? Uh, we also use single partition topics exclusively. And we have infinite retention, meaning we don't compact the topics and we don't expire any records. And we also run Kafka as an internal team, uh, internal service for other teams at the New York Times. So we're gonna talk about um, the conception of the pipeline. So take it, Stephen. So um, when we started this project to build a new publishing pipeline, um, what we had was just an absolute mess. Um, on the right is a diagram of all of our interconnected APIs and systems that deal with published content. So um, content would get produced in a CMS. Um, we have a few different CMSs, one main one. And, um, and from there, it would go into different APIs where it would be consumed by other APIs and services and then stored and served to other things downstream. So content was flowing and um, along the way, it was getting uh, changed slightly. So you'd have like an article, um, it, would be, it would have one representation from the CMS and then some service would get its hands on it and change it a little bit, change the format, um, add fields and things like that. And it would just kind of get messy. And then as you go, um, it's like a game of telephone. It just loses meaning and it kind of um, becomes harder to parse uh, and you don't know what service to go to um, to get your content or how to understand it. So at the outset, we had a few goals. Um, we wanted to get content into a well-defined format. So we started by defining a schema in Protobuf um, and we had evaluated a few different serialization formats. Um, Abro, JSON, and a couple others, um, and ended up at Protobuf. We wanted to have a, a single source of truth. So we wanted this to be like the one place where all the published content lived. And we wanted to share the full published history. So not just like what the articles look like today, but like what they looked like at every, every single time they were published. So an article you know, over its life might receive uh, a dozen or more publishes, various updates and like notes added. Um, so we wanted to capture that and make that available to um, to everyone in the organization. Sort of like a version control system. So going a little bit lower level, we wanted it to be real time. Um, so we wanted the um, we wanted everybody to have access to these publishes as they were occurring. We wanted the data to be normalized. So we had this idea that um, different systems would be publishing content from different uh, from you know different places, and they wouldn't necessarily be connected. For example. Um, an article might be published from one CMS, but its images might be published from another place. And these would be hard to synchronize. 
Um, so we wanted this concept of normalized data where uh, assets could reference one another. As a result of that, we wanted the, the data to be ordered so that the, um, the relationships could be expressed um, along, along the course of a topic. So as you're reading a topic, you'd be able to resolve the references that were present in the asset you were consuming. Since this was to be like our storage for all archive content, the data should, have been, should be persistent. And we wanted to make it chronological so that consumers would be able to consume from any point and seek around, go back like a week and replay the last weeks of data or start at the end and consume real time content. And we had just moved to Google Cloud Platform and there was a big focus on reducing our operational overhead. So we wanted to focus on using managed services over things and uh, databases and things that we would have to like handle ourselves. So conceptually we had all these, we had all these producers of content and they were connected directly up to consumers of content, um, each with their own, you know, storage of the data. And where we wanted to get to was a log based architecture where we would connect everything through a single source of truth, which is basically a log. Um, and this was inspired by um, articles by like uh, Kreps and Kleppman. Thanks, I got it. <laughs> um, so we started this about two years ago. And at the start, we had the idea that Kafka would be the best fit for what we wanted to do. Um, but some thought that Kafka would be too difficult to manage, uh, difficult for us to operate. So we were tasked with implementing the uh, log-based architecture using managed services exclusively, uh, services offered by Google Cloud Platform. So over the course of a few months, we experimented with a few uh, services such as PubSub and, PubSub and Dataflow, Cloud SQL, and Bigtable. Uh, this is what we first tried, is a combination of PubSub, Dataflow, and Bigtable. And going from left to right, we had a published service which exposed a bunch of gRPC endpoints and publishers would push content to that service, and the, con uh, the service in turn would put those messages onto PubSub. Now those messages being um, unordered, uh, Dataflow would be tasked with ordering those messages and batching them up and then putting them into Bigtable. And then the consumers would read uh, those messages in order from Bigtable. And this wasn't the best approach because um, we were aiming to have end-to-end latency of three seconds, meaning you publish the content on one end and then you got it out of the uh, big table in under three seconds. But for this implementation, we had eight seconds and this was due to the high watermark on uh, PubSub and Dataflow used that watermark to basically determine when it was okay to finish batching messages and then order them. Uh, we even sat down with the product team at Google um, and they, they even told us that if we wanted Kafka-like semantics, we should just use Kafka. Uh, because PubSub didn't offer the ordering the replay that we wanted. So this is our second attempt. This was kind of a middle of the road. We had managed services with a little Kafka-esque here. Um, so we saw the published service here uh, and the published service would append messages to Bigtable directly. And then consumers would consume from Bigtable using a client wrapped with the Kafka client API. So it looked like as if they were consuming Kafka, but under the hood, they had the semantics that would read from Bigtable. So I thought it was pretty cool. But the problem was, in addition to Bigtable being expensive, people looked at the implementation and they're like, oh, if you're gonna write Kafka, you might as well use Kafka. So this is the architecture that we landed on. And going from left to right, we have a publisher writing to the service that we call the gateway, which has a Kafka producer that appends messages to the log. And then we have a service called Bodega, which keeps the latest version of every asset from Kafka. So um, any given article, for example, will have multiple versions and you're going to have multiple revisions of that on the log. And then the consumer here will actually read that and then just store the latest version of that article and make it available to the consumer. So while we were, we were developing the pipeline, um, the front end team was also planning to launch a new uh, front end and they were, would be using this Bodega service here. So this is all going on at the same time. Uh, so in the beginning, we had some issues running Kafka. We had an issue uh, about two weeks before we were actually going to launch and we had Kafka running 
And we had this, uh, the front end team had their website pulling from this architecture and all eyes in the newsroom were sort of on this page. And anytime something went wrong, there was kind of like panic. You know? So on this day, uh, everyone in the newsroom started seeing stale content. And when they loaded up the site in the browser, this is kind of what they saw. So every time, this is a simulation, by the way, it's not the actual thing, but every time the slide changes, it's like a refresh, right? So if you kept on refreshing the home page, you'd see the site go forward in time. So um, this is kind of a problem. We don't want this to happen. So um, we wanted to avoid this time travel issue. Um, we didn't have any mechanisms in place to prevent like old content getting out there. So we had to look at the nature of the data, the single partition, and we had to uh, put checks in place to actually check the timestamp of the messages. And if somehow the consumer started reading from the beginning out of nowhere, we'd have to block that. And that's actually what happened here. Uh, someone actually launched a, um, a data migration and we started migrating all the data from start to finish on the homepage. And because it's a single partition topic, it takes a long time because you have to take that message and put it in the various stores before you can move on to the next one. So this issue happened around noon and by 8 p.m. we were almost caught up. We were at July in front of August. So um, eight hours is not a great time to recover. So uh, we implemented the blocks uh, on the Bodega Writer service that I spoke about before. And that has saved us on more than one occasion because your consumer offset can, you can read old content for various reasons. Um, you could have a new consumer ID or you could have a, a backfill of content that comes in from the archive. And for this particular application, we wanna make sure that we didn't handle those messages. And this will vary depending on the consumer's needs. Um, but we generally uh, tell our consumers, uh, the other teams that we manage Kafka for that they need to be cognizant of what kind of data that they can work with and be able to have some um, defensive coding in place to guard against that. So um, this, we actually operate a, a cluster in the east and a cluster in central and we replicate between the two. And um, there's more than that in this slide because this slide is taken from our data migration uh, playbook. Um, and what we're doing here is we're basically um, loading a new stripe of like archive content to the beginning of, of the topic and then um, feeding the current topic into the new topic. It's basically create a new topic from, um, from some like base uh, collection of data plus the real time data that's coming in from the newsroom. So all these little circles represent um, mirror maker instances. So there's a lot going on. These things um, have a lot of configuration and it's really easy to, uh, to launch these. Um, but really there's a lot of configuration. You have to give them all uh, consumer group IDs. You have to tell them what topic to read from, where to replicate to. And that's kind of where uh, we got into trouble. So I really recommend watch out for configuration mistakes when replicating data anywhere because it happens very quickly and it's hard to recover from. Um, we have a few tips we, uh, we use to, uh, to, to do that. Um, so. A good approach, um, as Mike mentioned, is to just observe the messages and stop replicating them or stop consuming them if you see something that is wrong. Um, so we use a check, uh, like if the message is older than 24 hours, just stop and then somebody has to step in and actually sort it out. Um, it's not the most robust, robust thing, but it's better than uh, having uh, hundreds of gigabytes of data in the wrong place. A better approach is to use headers to mark which messages have been replicated and avoid replicating them again. So this is an example of a custom mirror maker message handler. So basically what it's doing is as each message comes through, it's checking for a replication header. And if the replication header is set, it's just skipping that message. If it's not set, it sets the replication header and replicates the message. So a big thing in addition to keeping cop Kafka up and making sure it's running is to handle the user experience. So as I mentioned, we run Kafka for over a dozen teams, internal teams at the New York Times, and then each team has you know, more than one consumer. So something we've learned over the past couple of years is that setting up Kafka is often um, a developer's first experience using Kafka. Um, there are, people didn't generally have experience with Kafka before they started using the pipeline. 
So if they have a hard time setting up Kafka, it's going to kind of color their view of Kafka going forward. So um, it's something that you need to get right from the beginning. So there's several reasons why we had this frustration, which um, prevented you know, uptake of Kafka among the other teams. And one of them is that the documentation and examples that we wrote quickly became broken and out of date, especially when things would change in the beginning. Uh, and uh, we also chose a particularly complicated authentication mechanism. So uh, with these two things in play, uh, we often had to work one-on-one -on -one with the developer's outcome uh, for help. And that took a lot of time. So this combination of bad docs and complicated auth and long lead times due to setting up meetings and things like that just leads to a bad experience and user frustration in general. So we often heard this refrain, like, why can't it be as easy as PubSub, you know, Google Cloud PubSub. And when you set up a, a PubSub client, it's pretty easy. You just write some code, put the client there and throw it up on the cloud. And then the client just automatically infers the authentication credentials and, it, you know, it's good to go. Uh, this is not the case with Kafka where you, the developer has to configure Kafka off on the client side according to what's said on the broker side. So. So in the past year or so, we've thought about how we can improve this experience um, after, after running through these problems that I just described. And one of them was to create self-service onboarding, where if you want to get access to the monologue, you can get it yourself and you don't have to talk to us and it's a lot faster. Another is that we want to integrate with Google Cloud Platform's authentication architecture. Um, we use that for the rest of the services. So you know, you're using your service account to authenticate with everything. But for Kafka, there's a difference, right? You have to use whatever is available for Kafka. Another thing we want to do is to simplify the client um, configuration. So there's a certain um, set of options that you have to set in order to correctly consume the monologue. And as you may know, there are just tons of options available when you're setting up a client. And even with good documentation, you know, people mess this up. So we wanted to remove that from the equation. And also we wanted to double down on creating good documentation examples. So that's just like a best practice. So around the same time we were thinking about this, you know, reimagination of the onboarding experience, uh, SASL OAuth Bear was released. And I'm not sure if anyone here is familiar with that. It's a pretty new feature, but basically what it allows you to do is to set up configurable callback handlers to uh, generate tokens on the client side, which are sent to the broker. And then that configurable callback handler also validates tokens on the broker side. So you can basically uh, configure auth to how you want to use it as opposed to just working around whatever Kafka has to offer. So we implemented custom callback implementations that use the Google auth flow that we use for the rest of the services. And we were actually able to leverage the same code. So it's now it's just a homogenous authentication interface across all the publishing pipeline services. And with this, we were able to integrate into our self-service platform. So users can just instantly onboard with their service account information. They don't have to talk to us. We also wrote a helper library and we got some input from our existing users of Kafka to see like how we could make this easier. Um, it, it simplifies the task of creating a consumer um, and it only exposes the options that are necessary for creating that client. So the ones that are absolutely necessary for um, consuming the monologue, everything else just has sensible defaults. And with Sassel All Fair, there are about three extra client options that you have to set. So we wanted to hide that as well. So this is an example of the Java helper library. And as you can see, it's just a simple um, builder class. The options might be pretty obvious. The first one says that you're gonna authenticate with the compute engine. So when you launch this app, uh, it'll, it'll use the uh, compute engine metadata endpoint to get the credentials. The second one is just setting the consumer group ID. Um, and if this is a new um, consumer, default start at the end will tell the consumer to tail the log instead of consuming everything. And that's that's easier for people to understand instead of whatever is currently set with the consumer options. And the environment tells the, um, instructs the consumer to connect to a particular broker running in a particular region and to consume from a particular topic. So in this case, they don't even have to think about topics or broker addresses or, or anything. It's just automatically there. And this is sort of like how PubSub works. So once you do get the client up and running, there's also the problem of knowing whether it's working or not. And the best you can really do um, is just to log a message every time you're consuming something from the log. And we're not always getting messages in. There might be some delays, you know, a few tens of seconds, or whatever. So you're not really always sure. So at the time, there weren't any um, fr uh, free options that we knew of for 
knowing where a consumer was on the log and whether it was functioning. So we implemented what we called the offset monitor and that tells the consumer offsets topic. Um, it interprets the schema and then from that it will calculate the lag for each client. And it basically does that by looking at where the client currently is and subtracting that value from the last offset of the given topic. And it, it takes that difference and it writes it out to Prometheus and then with that we can easily graph it in Grafana. So this is an example of a consumer that's you know having a bad day or week. Uh, so you can see over the course of several days, the lag has gone from zero to a million. And in this case, we would assume that the, the consumer is not working. This is an example of a healthy consumer and you, know, you see some spikes, but in general, there's uh, no upward trend of, of lag. For each of our important consumers, we created a chart and we can see the lag for each one. And then we set up um, alerts on each one so that if the lag reaches a certain threshold, the team is alerted via Slack or PagerDuty or whatever and they can start um, fixing the problem. So this is like a pretty big win because before you never really knew what was going on. But this doesn't solve one problem. One fundamental problem we have is that we don't really know what the difference is according to this lag chart, what the difference is between a consumer that's dead and one that's just intentionally not there anymore. And um, this becomes an issue when you have an application that has multiple replicas. And as I mentioned before, we have a single partition topic and you can't, you can't scale up those reads. You can only have one consumer. Um, so each replica would have its own consumer group. And when that application scales down, um, according to the, la the log monitor, uh, it's just lagging at that point, right? So um, something we're kind of working on right now is thinking about setting up a special topic or API call that the consumer can hit and tell the offset monitor, hey, I'm done, I'm not doing anymore, stop recording uh, metrics. Um, so a while after we had like most of our archive data loaded into, the, um, into Kafka, um, a lot of questions started popping up about like, what's been migrated in and what hasn't, what things do we still have to like convert from some other system and put into Kafka. Um, and we really didn't have a great way to answer that. But one of the reasons we put everything into Kafka was so that we could create materialized views from it in other databases and then start asking or answering those questions. Um, so what we did was, um, as we mentioned, we have this, uh, this really deep proto buff schema. So what we're actually putting on Kafka is this event.proto message. Um, so that is the outer wrapper of everything that contains um, publishes and unpublishes of like any type of content you can imagine. So articles, images, and persons and organizations and various things that we consider top level content. Um, and then we feed that proto definition through a plugin for proto C called proto C gen BQ schema. And this outputs about 38,000 lines of JSON that is a BigQuery schema definition file. Um, we put that into BigQuery, uh, like it's the, it's the, uh, it's the DDL um, for it. And then we also do this for the block union proto, which is the, um, it's the, it's, it defines like the, the body content of an article. So that's also like a really uh, deeply nested message. And that's another 28,000 lines of, of schema. So we apply that to BigQuery and then we stand up with what's basically a, a really simple consumer application. Um, so it consumes from Kafka from the very beginning. So that would be like 1851 kind of content uh, when the times was started. Um, and it converts the protobufs into JSON, which is a straight one-to-one um, -one conversion to and from. So uh, then we buffer it up into large one gigabyte uh, buffers. And then we load that into BQ. We use a load operation to make this faster. Um, and then as we get close to the end of the log, we switch into streaming mode and use stream, uh, streaming inserts in BQ to make sure that, um, you know, as things are being published, they're being inserted into BigQuery with about a one second latency. So you can query all the data, all the fields in the entire schema um, pretty much in real time. Um, when the schema changes, it's pretty trivial to, um, to just trash the old tables in BigQuery and just start this process again from the beginning. Uh, it doesn't take all that long and it's pretty, pretty easy. But we uncovered some, some gremlins in the data this way. Um, some of the archive loads that other teams had been doing uh, actually were, were being done over and over again because the data wasn't right the first time um, and they had to republish 
a new copy of each article with fields added or corrected and things like that. So we had a lot of extra stuff. Um, there was actually no uh, referential integrity. Um, I mentioned that uh, the, the data points were normalized. So like an article might reference an image, but that image might actually only appear in the, in the Kafka topic at a later point in time. So this stuff has to be sorted eventually um, because we wanted people to be able to resolve these references as they were streaming content from Kafka. And there was actually like a really insane amount of election results. Um, the interactive team was uh, publishing real time like uh, live polling results uh, and they were they had set up an app that published these results every couple of seconds for every precinct for weeks so um, and these things were contained about like 700 kb of json so there were a lot of gigabytes of live election results which were just kind of um, just kind of taking up space and not doing a whole lot so by the numbers we have 41 million events on the log 5.6 million are redundant from archive loads um, 715,000 of this 2018 election polls keyword, it's the same every time. Um, this was just because uh, somebody made an app that would just publish this thing over every time it ran, every time it published live results, it would also publish this keyword. Um, and that's over 23 gigabytes of midterms results. So this is not, this is not really big data, but for a single partition, um, this really makes the experience suck for consumers. So going forward, um, actually, I'm going to let Mike talk about our plans going forward. OK. So one thing that we have to do eventually is topic migration. Um, we basically need to create a new monologue. Uh, there are a couple of reasons why we need to do this. And one is due to the tons of bad messages that have been put on the log, uh, as Steven mentioned, uh, like the election results and sometimes just botched um, data migrations. Um, we've been basically working to get all the archive data, fit it into a schema, and then publish it. Um, so we don't always get that right the first time. Um, we also, now that we have all the content from 1851 to today on the monologue, which was published at various times, things are out of order chronologically. We want to put the log into total chronological order so that when you have a log, you can start streaming from the beginning, which will get you content from 1851, and then will bring you all the way to today. So the problem with this is that with all of our consumers, they have to switch to the new topic fairly quickly. And um, that's because we don't wanna maintain two topics at the same time. The other is that it's difficult to coordinate with each of the um, teams to make sure that they're doing the right configuration change, that they're changing to the, the changing to the correct topic, and that they're also seeking to the correct offset on the log, depending on what their use case is. Um, so we've been thinking about how we can automate that because we want to do it more frequently in the future and to have to coordinate with those consumers every time that happens is, is just going to be very error prone. Um, so we want to do that. So what we've been working on is an L7 Kafka proxy, which is basically a service that speaks to Kafka protocol. And the way that would work is that uh, the proxy would have an, a topic alias called monologue and the consumers connect and say, give me the monologue. And then the proxy would actually translate um, this alias from the old topic to the new topic so that we can actually switch the topics from underneath the consumers without them even knowing. And this would actually handle all the um, offset seeking and things like that. Um, we've got some kind of like ideas of like infrastructure and ops improvements as well. So um, Confluent Cloud is on the radar, as I mentioned, um, you know, we want to use like all managed services, uh, but there wasn't really a managed thing for Kafka when we started this. Now there is, um, but it lacks some of like the auth features that we use now. Um, you can't really like plug in your own authorizers and uh, other things are just aren't pluggable. So waiting and just watching that, um, it's pretty expensive as well. Um, running the cluster on GKE, our Kubernetes engine on Google is um, one thing that we're looking at. It's, it's a better ops experience for us than running VMs. Um, we, as an organization, don't run a lot of VMs now. Most of it is like Kubernetes where the, the operation of the VMs is pretty much abstracted away. Um, and we just, we, we prefer to just work with containers on Kubernetes. Um, and we want to get better resource utilization. So most of the time, uh, as you could probably, as you could probably tell that this is not a very, um, big Kafka cluster and we don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of throughput with it. So um, we think we can get better resource utilization by um, 
putting these uh, like Kafka and Zookeeper into smaller pods within our Kubernetes cluster. Um, we're also looking into serverless integrations. So a lot of teams use um, things like Google App Engine and Cloud Functions, which are um, serverless solutions and they don't run all the time. That's kind of the whole premise. They just, you know, they spin up when they're needed and they're usually invoked by a pub sub message or a webhook. So um, we're looking at things to glue Kafka and those things together um, since they won't, they won't do the long polling uh, TCP connection to Kafka at all. Um, um, okay, so we're done. And uh, thank you, Stephen. It. <laughs> um, I do want to mention that we are hiring for a new manager role of this team. So if you like Kafka and the New York Times and you want to be a manager, um, come speak to me after the, meet after the meetup. So thank you. Any questions? Oh, I think we need to get the Sorry, wait for this cube. <laughs> So um, are there that. any uh, size restrictions on individual messages? There are not, I don't think. I don't think no. we have anything. Um, However, no. well, so this is kind of a problem that we run into. Um, sometimes the, there are these interactives which are published, and they're basically huge like HTML blobs. And sometimes they're um, they include like media that they shouldn't and then they get published and then we have this huge asset on log. It doesn't happen very often, um, but we don't actually have like a check right now, but there's no theoretical size restriction, but we want to work to reduce the amount of big publishes that are put on, for sure. In principle, I think you're not supposed to have very large protobuf messages, but um, I don't know if things would necessarily break if you did, so I think it's pretty much okay. Yeah, oh, the one last thing too is what we did for these big interactives is actually when we receive the message, we just chop off the huge payload and we store it elsewhere. Um, so that way when you're consuming the log, if you really want that data, you can look at the reference and then retrieve it from uh, cloud storage. So, yeah. Uh, you may have already said it, um, but what was the logic behind choosing one um, uh, one shard per topic instead of having like multiple or, or, or is there going to be like a scaling logic to have for bigger topics with multiple publications to it? Would you have more than one shard? Are you talking about the, the choice of one, uh, one single partition topics? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the single partition topic is because we wanted the consumers to see the, the events in order. And that's because the events have a, uh, like a reference, uh, and a relationship to one another. So, um, if, uh, if, if an article comes along on, on the topic uh, and it references three images, those images are separate things on the, on the topic and they, they should come before it. So that way the consumer is able to assemble the bigger, uh, the bigger piece. Yeah, so the producers basically, they put like this huge um, normalized, uh, denormalized uh, payload onto the, um, onto the log and it, well no, they create the different bricks what we call their denormalized assets and they put them in and they're topologically sorted so that's the reason and we would need to be able to separate the different data and know that there's like one group that doesn't reference the other at all in order to separate into different topics and different partitions and that's just kind of not possible right now for us if we have um some kind of if we have some kind of data being published that doesn't have any like referential relationship, we could split it into like separate topics and scale that way. But for stuff coming out of the CMS, at least right now that like a lot of it is referential and, and uh, just goes into the one topic. Thanks. I have kind of two different questions. One is, have you evaluated a uh, case sequel at all? As a we have, um, we've been looking at that, but our, um, so our serialization formats, protobuf, there's something in the works uh, for protobuf support, but it's not complete yet. Um, but yeah, it's on the radar. Um, we thought about, there's one solution we could do, which is like replicate everything from protobuf to JSON into a separate topic and then just apply case equal there. Um, so yeah, that's something we're watching. Yeah. I was thinking because you said the CMS is referential, so it would allow you to have a, maintain the same denormalized taxonomy, which could be helpful. And then the second part, which is totally different. Um, what's your, uh, what was the team approach? You know, lean agile, uh, SRE type, DevOps. I mean, how did you guys organize structurally and, and deliver 
um, or was it just more load and go kind of model? You talk about when we were developing the pipeline? Industry. Developing it and then sustaining it and then obviously go through your future release iterations. So, you know, gotcha. you have multiple sprint well, threads going on. So. Right. So I think for the first year or so, we had a lot of freedom um, to just experiment with this stuff. Um, we tried different, many different things and that's what we settled on. And then it came to a point where we're like, okay, we're in production now. So, um, so uh, how would you describe it after production? Uh, it's, it's like, a, it's like a, an agile thing. We actually do like a Kanban style kind of thing, um, standups uh, over Slack. And um, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty relaxed and, and just um, of, uh, there's like a, a lot of room for like prototyping and kind of figuring things out. And uh, yeah, a large focus on um, doing things in GCP with like managed stuff. So. And are you leveraging like a like a data driven test methodology or using like customer journeys to kind of map what the because obviously um, you have a worldwide customer journey of whatever 100 million people that that want to touch it. So, so um, I like to think that we don't really we're not really concerned on the publishing pipeline team about what the data is that's going on. For the most part for us, it's just kind of bites. So um, it's more up to the product teams and it's actually a separate schema team to determine the schema and evolve the schema. So for us day to day, we don't, not really concerned with the schema, but um, going forward, we actually have absorbed the schema team, I think, or the, that responsibility. So we're gonna be thinking about that more. Um, in terms of DevOps, we, we run it, uh, use Ansible mm -hmm. and um, we release whenever we need to. We use drone too a lot. So um, everything is uh, drone, every, CI, drone CI. Yeah, drone CI. Um, everything is is in containers and um, pushing to Git. It like uh, builds and, and deploys instantly. Um, and then we just use like a pull request to do a release to production. Um, other questions in the back? I saw some people. Can someone bring the cube? <laughs> <laughs> I have a quick. I have a couple questions. How big is your cluster in terms of zookeepers and brokers? And sorry, I know you said you're using VMs. Um, what is your replication factor and have you experienced any zone, zonal failures and how do you uh, resolve that if you did? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we have zone failures pretty often. Uh, our replication factor is three. So we have three brokers, five zookeeper nodes. Um, generally, it's not really a problem. Um, when a, when a node goes offline, um, it's okay because of uh, the quorum is still maintained and all that. So that's not really been an, an issue for us. And what if all of your, all of your brokers go down, like everything went down? Uh, we have a backup cluster in another region. So we're active, active but both regions. Your producer won't be able to publish to a Kafka for now, for, for a, for a, yeah, few minutes, the, so. produ the producers are, um, are able to fail over to the other cluster and the data is being replicated uh, like back and forth from the two clusters, like, like from, e from central to east and east to central. So um, if that happens, there's a little bit of lift on the, con on the producer and consumer side to just switch clusters, um, but it's not too bad. I see. And um, that proxy that we're talking about before, we're hoping to automate that whole process um, eventually too. And one more question. So you have this... Uh, one topic, let's say for images, which stores all the image, images for the post. And in another topic, you have all the posts. So how do you correlate? Like, how do you say that, all right, this image relates to this post? Uh, so every, everything, even if it's an image or an article, um, is, is just in one, one single topic and one partition. And they're all encapsulated in this event wrapper message. So we have the event message and then the publish message. And then within the publish, there's every possible like content type that you could think of. Um, so that's that the, they're, so they're all ordered on a single partition topic. And then, um, to resolve the references, we have a message called the reference message. It's a reference dot proto, and it just has a URI that points to another, um, another message. So every message has a URI and you can embed a reference that points to another one. Thanks. 
Um, hi, I was wondering if you could explain the need for Bodega and what you use at the data store and why not like a K table or? A K table? Oh, is that a KSQL thing? Uh, no, it's, it's more like um, it just, it keeps the latest record. And so you could have like a oh, stream writing to a K table instead, maybe. Just curious. Um, I don't know if we've looked into that too much, honestly, but I think we also might have been in production before KSQL, and that's just kind of hard to change. Uh, sorry, before Kafka Streams, or I honestly don't really have a great answer for Oh, you. is it only Kafka Streams? Okay. Yeah. What do you use yeah. as your data store? Um, so we have a combination of Google Cloud Storage to store the assets, uh, Google Data Store um, for the URL, URI uh, relationship, and then on top of that, we have a, a caching layer in Redis. So that Bodega Writer, what it does is it actually will write to the cache first to make it available quickly. And then behind the scenes, it will write to cloud storage and data store. And then when it's finally done, it will commit that message. So we can actually survive for pretty long with having our, our, our storage backends down. And it's been a pretty good for us. Cool, thank you. One more? Okay, one more question. Is this the best question ever? Yes. <laughs> no. I think, I think it's gonna be, just let's hear it. I'm just curious if you evaluated Burrow for um, lag monitoring. I've heard of Burrow. I, have, I haven't heard of Burrow. Um, we have not evaluated it, but I've heard of it. <laughs> I, I've actually, what happened is after we wrote this offset monitor, we saw that other people were doing pretty much the same thing. Um, which is pretty cool. But actually what we've moved to now is that we're no longer using a consumer offsets topic. We're using the Kafka admin API, which is really nice. So we don't have to consume the log anymore to get that data. We can just pull Kafka. It's been a lot faster. I think we can't ask any more questions. Uh, we had one over here. I feel really bad if I don't let you ask it because I already pointed at you. Oh, wait, wait, we gotta wait for the cube. Cube's coming. Um, do you have multiple, like, before you write to your, to your data store, you have, do you have multiple instances writing to that data store and how are you managing those instances if they're multiple? Right. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, there's only one thing writing to this data store. Um, and that is important because we, um, we want the events to be written to the data store in order so that they can be retrieved out of the data store in order as well. Um, so that's a really important part. Um, so yeah, only one single thing is writing to this data store. It's, it's an order relative to the producer, right? So um, the producer will create an article and decompose it in different parts and then make sure that it publishes all the components in the correct order. Yeah. Okay. And an interesting kind of consequence of, of having a single partition topic is you kind of impose that all the consumers will also be single threaded and writing the things in order. Otherwise, if they're not writing them, if they're not writing them serially, then you lose the order. Oh, sorry. I think I think we're out of time. Yeah, I think we're out of time. Sorry. Um, we'll be around though. So if yeah. you guys want to talk about this more, you know, feel free. Thank you. Thanks. My name is uh, Jamie Okisa, and I work on big data stores at Datadog. And today I'm going to share some thoughts on Kafka capacity planning. Um, so for a little bit of background, we run a multi petabyte Kafka footprint. Um, this sustains tens of gigabytes uh, per second in consumer traffic. And this never shuts off. Uh, it's on 24 seven, 365. Um, I've actually worked on SASs in the past that you know, had a little bit of a relaxed constraint. It was like really weird. It's like, We've got multi petabyte, you know, data stores, but they shut down on Tuesday, which is like really weird, but it makes maintenance easy. Um, this is not the case here. So maintenance is not easy. Um, it's also a globally distributed infrastructure. As they wax, the statue struck a pose outside the intrepid museum. <laughs> <laughs> I could have talked about that. All right. So with those things said, we also have continuous growth. Um, everything that I talk about today, the scale is probably gonna be significantly larger in 10 months from now. So what is the motivation for capacity planning? Um, like, why is this something we care about? Um, two thoughts come to mind. First one is that poor utilization at scale is super expensive. 
you're spending hundreds of thousands a month on infrastructure, 10 and 20% gains apparently are worthwhile. Number two is that we have a desire for predictable performance. Um, Kafka is often an architectural centerpiece. Um, you break Kafka and you tend to break a lot of things, right? Um, in our internal analytics, we found that shortages of capacity are one of the top reasons for outages. Before we uh, talk about you know, doing Kafka capacity planning, understanding resource consumption is important. So for CPU, uh, Kafka tends to tie this up on things like message rates, compression, and compaction if you use it. Um, doing things like more partitions uh, per broker and higher message rates for a given throughput, you'll see it tie up more CPU. Oop, sorry. For memory, uh, Kafka's actually got a pretty efficient and steady heap usage. This is because of lots of good designs that they've made and it's just something that you don't really have to play with too much. I find that unsurprisingly, heap settings for really, thro really low throughput brokers, they tend to not be that different for you know, what I was finding and just doing POCs. The rest of the memory really just goes to the page cache. For disk, we have both you know, two dimensions of how we consume resources here, uh, bandwidth. So you know, are the disks actually able to sustain the read and write volume? For the most part, the write volume is actually persisting the data to disk. Um, if you're familiar with the fact that um, you know, Kafka is using the page cache heavily, uh, if you have up-to-date consumers or up-to-date uh, followers, for the most part, you're hitting the page cache. So disk bandwidth and reads is you know, typically not a huge issue. And the second part is storage capacity. So not only the bandwidth of the disk, but making sure that you have enough disk storage capacity to hold all of your topics, because that's the point of Kafka. And the last thing, finally, network. This is um, you know, tied up from consumers. So we see a pretty big inflation rate. So for everything that we write, we see about a 13 to one inflation from consumer traffic. So if you're sending in one gigabyte per second to a uh, cluster, we tend to see about 13 gigabytes per second outbound. And then also a bit of that is used for replication, which is you know, typically one to one or one to two if your replication factor is higher. Let's talk about how Kafka makes capacity planning easy. So through the lens of the USL, if you're familiar with that, it's actually got really low contention and crosstalk. Uh, not having complex queries like other databases such as Elasticsearch, it just makes things really easy to deal with. Uh, what this means is that we have really predictable load responses in relation to client reads and writes. Uh, this is unlike, you know, if you went into Cassandra and you said, here's a big complex query, you could crush the machine. With Kafka, it's pretty flat, right? Like this actually makes it really easy to deal with. Um, subsequently, this exposes mostly bandwidth problems. So everything in Kafka is highly sequential and batched. Um, and the primary workload that we see is essentially a nonstop stream of, uh, of bytes, right? Going in and out. It's just, it's a, it's a giant byte pipe. Kafka also makes capacity planning hard. One of the reasons for this is the default tools weren't really made for scaling. If you use reassigned partitions, um, it's really for simple partition placement. It doesn't give you great control on what partitions are going where. And there's a lot of you know, problems that we faced with that, that particular thing that we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. Another thing is that there's not really an administrative API, at least not like a standalone one. Um, most of the administrative you know, operations are done through the actual client, right? They add like a, a client API layer and it's, not really the best, you know, if you compare it to something, again, like Elasticsearch, there's an HTTP endpoint, you can inspect resources and make changes to the database and so forth. Kafka doesn't have this. Um, so with the way that Kafka consumes resources and the challenges that I described, uh, I looked at this and I thought about, you know, what can we make from this? Is there a scaling model that we can, we can draw from this? And it, it's turned out that there was with a little bit of extra software. Um, so first, created a project called Kafka Kit. This is open source, and the purpose of this is for scaling and managing Kafka. Um, it's actually got a couple tools in it. Um, two of them uh, that relate to the problems I described, uh, reassigned partitions being overly simple and there being no API. Uh, those are addressed with the two tools here. Um, Topic Mapper is used for intelligent partition placement. Originally, it was just a drop-in replacement for reassigned partitions, and it turned out to do a lot more. The second thing is a service called Registry. This is a work in progress. Um, so this essentially gives you a Kafka API that exposes endpoints using gRPC and HTTP. Um, the idea of this is that all of the Kafka resources could be looked up and a resource could be you know, a topic or a broker. Um, and most of the default attributes that you would typically associate with a broker, such as like a rack ID um, or with a topic, you know, what the partition count is, the replication factor is, 
these automatically become tags in registry and you can use it for filtering. So you can say, give me all topics uh, tagged X with a partition you know, count of 32, right? And it just returns it via gRPC or HTTP. Um, there's also arbitrary user tagging. So you can also say, uh, add this tag to this topic and add it to this other topic. That way, when you do lookups, you get those things. Um, and additionally, there's referential lookups. So you can say, for this topic, where are all the brokers that hold it? Or you can invert it. For this broker, what topics does it hold? Um, today, we'll mostly be talking about Topic Mapper because Registry, so far, doesn't have any bearing on capacity planning. Second part of this uh, scaling model is defining a simple workload pattern. So you've probably heard about this before if you saw Balthazar's talk on putting Kafka in Kubernetes. Um, Balthazar is a colleague of mine. And uh, so we have this model where we bind specific topics to specific sets of brokers, and we call that a pool. So a pool might be topics A, B, and C, and brokers you know, 1001 through 1010, and so forth. And we run multiple of these pools per cluster. And the primary drivers for sizing these pools is really disk capacity and network bandwidth. If you go back to the resource consumption that I talked about, I think if you're using the right instance type, CPU and memory are generally just something you don't really deal with, and you're really just having to think about disk and network. So in the scaling model, initially, Topic Mapper builds an optimal partition to broker pool mapping. Um, so again, if you look at this reference here, we have you know, some example topics, and they might be bound to very specific brokers. Below this, this would be another broker pool, but I don't have a diagram showing more topics bound to it. Topics and pools are scaled individually. You can kind of think of these almost as subclusters within the cluster. So if you're running a large cluster, you might have 10 pools in it. And we only think about the capacity of pool A versus pool B. They have no bearing on each other. If pool A is exhausting capacity, it doesn't matter to pool B, none of the brokers are shared. And then finally, Topic Mapper also handles repairs, storage rebalancing, and pool expansion. And we'll talk about what that means. And then like I was saying, a large cluster might be composed of dozens of pools and hundreds of brokers. Um, I don't have you know, any, any size in mind of you know, what is the upper limit of a Kafka cluster. It's a, it's a common question you know, people tend to ask with data stores. Um, I'd probably be comfortable putting two, three petabytes on a Kafka cluster if you could do concurrent recoveries. I think that's one of the biggest things. <laughs> Someone thought it was funny. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest things with Kafka that limits the, uh, the upper bounds. Um, like I said in the, uh, you know, scaling Kafka is easy slide. Uh, the throughput problems are, are pretty simple, you know, dealing with a, a stream of bytes, like throw hardware at it, just make sure you're making good use of hardware. And that's what we do in our scaling model. But other than that, it's really about the concurrent recoveries that, um, you know, lets me think about how large a cluster should be. Talk about sizing pools now. So we target a utilization of 60 to 80% on any given broker pool. And there's a little bit of a range here because it depends on the topic growth rate. Topics that grow more quickly, you want more headroom. Your topic's kind of trickling in storage over time and it's consistent. You don't need to throw a huge amount of overhead to it. Otherwise, you're gonna have poor utilization for a longer period of time. The network capacity depends on several factors. And again, if you notice the theme here, I'm kind of not talking about CPU or memory. The way we think about capacity planning, it's mostly a disk and network problem. And the two biggest factors here are consumer demand. So if you take all of your consumers, how much network bandwidth are they gonna consume? The second thing is our MTTR targets, our mean time to recovery. Um, one of the things that we care about here is leaving 20 to 40% headroom just for replication. And actually, I'll go back and make a comment on that. The reason for this is that your replication throughput, it's the biggest determinant on your MTTR. So if you, if you only have headroom to replicate, you know, 100 megabytes per second, your broker holds, you know, like X amount of storage, like do some math there. What is the minimum time you can take to replace this broker? Um, if you see some frightening numbers, then you might realize why we, we, we leave so much replication headroom. Um, it's not unusual for us to run replication, you know, for recovery is at five, 600 megabytes per second per broker. Let's talk about determining broker counts. So there's a couple steps to this. First thing is determining the number that we need for storage. And we do this by looking at um, for each broker pool, we look at how much storage do we need for all the topics in that pool at full retention. And what we do is we divide the number of, um, well, the amount of storage per node 
um, you know, by looking for 80% utilization. And again, it depends on what your target is. I'm using 80% here because it's our, our standard baseline. And this will give you the number of nodes that you need. Second, we do the same thing for network. We look at the consumer demand, and then we look at the bandwidth available per node. And we figure 60% because, like I said, you want to reserve some percentage strictly for replication. In this case, it might be 40%. And the pool size is basically the greater of either of those two factors rounded up to the nearest integer. And in reality, we actually do a pretty good job at hitting this. This is a snapshot of a couple dozen maps inside of a random production cluster. Um, we've got one straggler down there, and my guess is that it was probably actually recently scaled, and it's likely going to consume that storage we've thrown at it. Let's talk about instance types. Building pools, we know how to size them. They need some sort of machine spec. So the first thing is that when you're figuring out those counts, there's a huge delta between the required counts for storage and network. You're probably using the wrong instance type. If you figure out that you need 20 nodes to hold the amount of data that you intend to at full retention, you need you know, 60 nodes just to cover the bandwidth requirements, probably the wrong instance type. So remembering that this is highly sequential bandwidth bound workloads brings a couple instance types to mind. And I'll use AWS as an example for this. I usually think of D2s, I3s, and the H1 class. So D2s, the spinning rust is actually pretty great. A lot of people hear databases and they hear, you know, spinning disks and they're like, oh no, it probably doesn't work. And the thing is, Kafka's is not really latency bound. If you have latency sensitivity, um, you probably want your consumers up to date. They're reading from the page cache. If they're hitting the disk, you've, and the latency of, you know, spinning disks is not good enough for you, it's like you're kind of already screwed anyways if you're out of the page cache. Um, so I think that these are good for storage per dollar. If you look at you know, sizing a cluster and if storage is your primary driver, D2s are obviously cheap. And I see that these you know, are best used for retention bias workloads. You wanna hold on to a lot of data for a long period of time. The problems of these, reasons not to choose them. So these have the older networking and the disk bandwidth far exceeds the network. Going back to talking about, you know, people assume disks are too slow one thing I find with D2s is that they sustain a consistent about 160 megabytes per second per spindle in sequential synchronous throughput. I mean, so the D2 4XL, you're gonna see over 900 megabytes per second of read-write. So the problem is clearly not the storage performance here. It's actually the network. Um, so D2 4XLs, again, using those for reference, um, we only see, I'm sorry, D2 2XLs. I'm forgetting because I stopped using these. Um, we only reliably see about 120 megabytes per second um, you know, of network throughput, and sometimes a little bit lower and sometimes a little bit higher. Problem is this leads to long MTTRs. Um, it's not unheard of. Um, you know, if you look at the, the ratio of storage density versus network throughput with a D2, to find that it takes upwards of 20 hours to completely unload a fully loaded broker, which is probably intolerable for most people. H1s, I actually had high hopes for these. I thought these would be a modernized D2. The reason for this is they come with the excellent uh, ENA-based network adapters. So this is much more consistent. We see using like an H1 4XL, for example, I, I tend to see, you know, 600 megabytes per second in single flow transfers, which is like pretty amazing. Problem is now Amazon didn't get it right and the, uh, the storage throughput doesn't keep up with the network now. So with these, you tend to see you know, 600 megabytes per second on the network, but the storage might cap out at 450 megabytes per second. So now you've got this fast network, but you can't necessarily make use of it. So what are these typically used for? Um, I like these for kind of a balance of a little bit lower retention, you know, at least in comparison to a D2, but high throughput workloads. If you're keeping everything in the page cache, these are super fast. ENA networking is definitely what you want to use. Um, so, I kind of named the first problem here. The second thing is that going back to the MTTRs, um, they become disk bound here. So again, we've got this really fast network, but you can't catch up, you know, lagging uh, or newly provisioned brokers fast enough to really make use of it. Um, so it's not great. So I3s, these are bandwidth monsters. I do like these. Um, one of the main things, if you notice my theme here of being all MTTR focused, they're really low MTTRs. Like, it's so easy to saturate network on these. And as long as there's enough bandwidth left over for consumers, you just don't really see the impact. Like this storage is absurdly fast. It's kind of overkill. It's not my ideal instance, but it's probably the, the best overall if you really care about having fast recovery times. Uh, for our critical path clusters, we absolutely do. So we do use I3s in some places. And then in other places, we're using other instance types where we don't necessarily need those super low MTTRs because it's expensive, 
um, and we care a little bit more about storage retention. Another thing too is that, you know, typically when you think of SSDs, you really care about the latency. I think one of the biggest things is that when you have concurrent IO outside of the page cache, so multiple lagging consumers, multiple brokers catching up, uh, the performance of the storage degrades a lot more gracefully than it does with, um, you know, the, the spinning disk types. Um, particularly, one thing I didn't like about the, the, uh, the H1s is that when you start getting concurrent reads from different, you know, sections of, of the log, the performance just really just starts to degrade. And I'm going to kind of bucket all these other instance types. So like R4, C5s, all this sort of thing and using GP2, EBS. So this actually works pretty well. This is another one of those things people hear databases and they think like EBS, they're like, it's network storage, no way it's going to work. So it actually works pretty well. I've ran pretty big workloads, um, not Kafka, but other things on EBS. The, the actual EBS volume performance is great. The problem is that you tend to have really low EBS channel bandwidth in relation to instance sizes. So for something like elastic searches might be okay because you, the, the load that you're putting on the box is significantly higher in relation to the right volume. Whereas with Kafka, you know, it's, it's continuously streaming. Like everything you write to it, it's got to hit storage at that same rate. One of the things that I find is if you look at the table of, you know, how much EBS bandwidth do you get per box? Um, when you get enough, like whatever enough means, if you just have some, some you know, number in mind, say for instance, it's, it's tailored to your MTTR targets, you'll find that the box just ends up being absurdly huge. You're like, oh, well, I need a 16 XL, I guess, to get 500 megs a second. It's definitely not the storage, the EBS channel bandwidth. I could see that changing at some point. Second thing is really, it's just the burden of running a distributed replicated store. Uh, this is, you know, really, we, we, we built this, this sort of thing. You know, Kafka exists so that you don't have to rely on underlying you know, infrastructure tricks, right? Um, which is, in practice, it's fine, right? Running a distributed replicated store on, on EBS, but EBS is really built to solve tech problems you know, from 2009. Like you run an exchange server and it's just too hard to, to, to recover it, right? It's like if the hypervisor fails, you just want the storage to plop somewhere else. With Kafka, it gives you kind of a weird Venn diagram of like risks that I just, I don't really see why you'd want them to overlap. And at that point, you may want to just consider Kinesis. Um, Sorry, it's a little bit of a hot take of the day. Data placement. This is choosing where partitions go inside of a pool. So we talked about sizing pools, both in finding instance counts and ideal instance types. Data placement is something that Topic Mapper went from being just a reassigned partitions replacement to something much more. And some of the things that it does. So Topic Mapper optimizes for maximum leadership distribution. I think this is something most Kafka users understand. You can have multiple replicas, but you're only going to do your I.O. against the leader. So you want maximum leadership distribution. If you, for instance, had two brokers and they were sharing, you know, several partitions and only one broker was the leader for all those partitions, you only get half of the maximum bandwidth you have available. So it's important to actually distribute your leaders. Replica rack ID isolation. So this is having, you know, replicas not in the same rack ID, which I think for most users, if you're on Amazon, that, you know, maps directly to an availability zone. This is important for durability. Another thing is maximum replica list entropy. This sounds made up. I'm going to describe this. I need a drink before this description. Yeah. So this is uh, for all partitions that a given broker holds, ensuring that partition replicas are distributed among as many other unique brokers as possible. And this actually continues. So problem that this is describing is that it's possible to have maximal partition distribution among all of your brokers, but a low number of unique broker to broker relationships. So what that means is that you could take a hundred partitions and throw them over five brokers. And you might find that two of the brokers tend to share each other's replica sets. And then two other brokers tend to share each other's replica sets. That's not good. You actually want to max that out. So for an example, Say broker A holds 20 partitions and all 20 of those replica sets contain only three other brokers. This is kind of an extension of what I was naming. So if we had a cluster with at least 20 brokers in it, ideally those replica sets could be held by 20 other brokers. You have a low level of max, um, I'm sorry, if you have a low level of replica list entropy, um, you might find that all 20 of those replicas, it's only shared with the other brokers. So Topic Mapper expresses this as node degree distribution. If you're familiar with graph theory, this is a, basically a measure of connectedness among nodes. So if you have a high node 
node degree, that means that node has a lot of relationships with other nodes. Broker to broker relationships, it's literally a graph. Um, one way that you can explore this is that replica sets are partial adjacency lists. So if you take replica sets for a given broker, um, it's part of a graph. You take all of the adjacency lists for all of the brokers, you could actually represent all the replica sharing as a complete graph, which is interesting. So we use this example. We have partition zero and partition one. Partition zero, the instinct replica list is brokers one, two, and three. And in partition one, we have brokers two, three, and four. And if you look at broker three's adjacency list, it becomes one, two, and four. And you get that because if you were to look at its neighbors and all of its replica sets, um, and you, know, you, you look at it as a set, so no, no duplicates, you get one, two, and four. And because of the length of this list is three, it's degree distribution, or I'm sorry, it's no degree is three. So the idea is that we want to maximize a replica list entropy. And there's reasons for this. In broker failure and replacements, you probabilistically increase the replication sources. Um, what that means is that if a broker fails and you replace it with another one, it's going to read from as many unique sources as possible. It's going to make your recovery faster and it's going to have lower impact on the recovery sources. So again, these are the three items the topic mapper optimizes for. There's some other things, but I think it might be out of the scope of this. So maintaining pools. Um, now that we size pools and we've decided what machines to put them on and we start operating them, over time you have to actually maintain them. Things happen to them and they start to change because they're dynamic. Two of the most common tasks are ensuring broker storage balance and doing simple broker replacements. We'll talk about broker storage balance first. So this is something the topic mapper does. The way that it does it, it's driven off Datadog metrics. It's pluggable, eventually it's gonna support other metric systems, but right now it basically fetches just a single metric. And the only one we care about is the storage free per broker and the partition sizes. With that information alone, you could actually do uh, you know, storage rebalancing. And the way this works is that we look for candidates to offload inside of a pool. So if we see a pool and there's some brokers that are heavily utilized, it might be time to scale it, right? Um, I'm sorry, not scale, but rebalance it. And the, di the difference here, I'll actually talk about scaling. We rebalance when we might see brokers getting near their capacity limits, but the total pool utilization is not quite to the point that we need to add more capacity. So your pool utilization might be 60%, but you might see brokers getting hot. So the idea is to take partitions from those hottest brokers and move them to the least utilized. And there's a couple steps for Topic Mapper to do this. First, we find offload candidates. These are some, some brokers that are some distance below the harmonic mean storage free. And the reason we use the harmonic mean is that it's a little more resilient to outliers and the idea is that it'll help actually better magnify them. So in this example here, this is a bunch of brokers in a highly imbalanced pool. And the red arrow is pointing at what might be the mean storage free and let's say it's one terabyte. If we're using the default distance of 20%, that means find all brokers that, that have less than 800 terabytes of free storage. And it might target those three that we see down here. And you have to keep in mind to look at this in the inverse. This is storage free. So those three circled at the bottom are the most utilized. And we want to take partitions from those and move them to, to more suitable brokers. So what it does is it plans those relocations from the most to least utilized brokers. And it does this using a fair share of first fit descending bin packing algorithm. Um, the way that this works is that it actually iterates over the offload brokers several times. What makes a fair share is that for each iteration, an offload candidate is only eligible to offload it one partition at a time. If we didn't do it this way, if you went to the most overloaded broker and you said, let's free up a bunch of storage, it might tie up all the good destination candidates and therefore the other heavily loaded brokers have nowhere to relocate their data. And then what it does is it continues to run this loop until no more you know, relocations can be planned. Um, what designates that no more relocations can be planned is uh, there's two, two primary conditions. The first is that the brokers being offloaded, if they're gonna free up too much storage, you obviously don't wanna unload them too much, then they become underutilized. And the second is if destinations would take on too much storage. And we set those thresholds using a tolerance from the mean. And all these parameters are configurable. So the parameter of finding what brokers are eligible for offload and then what our offload targets are, are both just simple flags that you pass on a topic mapper. So when you actually run this, it generates a reassigned partitions compatible file and then you apply it just like you would if you're using um, reassigned partitions, right? And the outcome of this 
this would be, you know, a real map that we've, we've applied a rebalance to. You can see that the utilization spreads greatly reduce. The idea is to bring all the brokers as close to the harmonic mean as possible. Second thing is broker replacements. So when a single broker fails, how do we choose a replacement? This seems easy. I was actually having trouble trying to frame this problem into some slides, so we'll see how I describe it. So the goal is to retain any previously computed storage balance. So as we rebalance these pools, we have specific brokers holding very specific topics. And that's what gives, or I'm sorry, very specific partitions, I guess partitions from the topic. And that gives us our storage balance. And the thing is that we want to actually keep that level of storage balance. If a single broker fails and you patch in two random brokers to replace one failed broker, the amount of storage it was holding is now split among those two brokers. And now you have two lowly utilized brokers. And the idea is to do one-to-one -one replacements. Um, so the problem with this is that when brokers die, they're no longer visible in Zookeeper. And this is where the rack ID you know, information is registered. This is easy for a human to figure out this problem, but there's some primitives here that we actually want machines to be able to determine what a good replacement is. And there's a reason for this. So Topic Mapper can be provided, um, you know, hot spares from varying rack IDs. And the idea is that it's supposed to figure out which one is suitable to choose, because we don't leave these hot spares around forever. Um, otherwise, this problem would be easy to solve. The overall goal of this is that we want high utilization, right? We want to maintain it. We don't want any waste. So it infers a suitable replacement with a feature called substitution affinity. This is just a flag that you flip on. And what it intends to do is it doesn't read any of the metrics data like it would for, you know, storage-based partition placement. It's kind of doing something really dumb. For every impacted ISR, we want one single broker to fill in all those holes. So the way that this works, the way that it figures out where to choose a replacement broker from is that we first traverse all of the ISRs and all of the topics that the affected pool is holding. And it builds a set, and we'll refer to this global. In global, the set of rack IDs might be 1A, 1B, 1C, and 1D. Next, we traverse all the affected ISRs. And by affected, I mean ones that were impacted by the broker loss. And we build another set, and this is called live. And all the live brokers in the affected ISRs, let's say that those brokers reside in 1A and 1C. And then the next step is basically we want to, we want to find a list of, um, you know, rack IDs that are suitable to choose a replacement from. And this is defined in sub builder notation here. It's actually really simple what it's, what it's actually doing. It's any broker that was found in global, or I'm sorry, any rack ID that was observed in global and not currently used by any live broker in the affected ISRs. That's a suitable uh, availability zone to choose a broker from. It won't break any of the placement constraints. And the placement constraints, keeping in mind the problem here is that if you randomly chose a broker, say from AZA, and you start placing in all the holes that were left behind by failure, if you find one of the replicas are, you know, in, in the affected ISRs from AZA, you've got a problem there. The idea is to always spread out your replicas across rack IDs. And so the result of this, the set would become 1B and 1D. Um, it'd be nice if the global and the live sets were all on this one screen, but what this means is that we can choose any broker from 1B or 1D, and it won't break any of the placement constraints. And Topic Mapper will automatically choose a hotspot from there and go about the repair. And so the outcome of this, like I mentioned, is that we keep specific brokers bound to specific pools. We don't want to just start randomly choosing brokers. You'll find that over time, it's very easy to start breaking your, uh, your utilization. And you'll find these straggler brokers that are at 5%. That's not good. Another thing, too, is that the repairs are really simple. Um, right now, they're still unfortunately done by humans, but the process was made to be as hands-off as possible. Not only finding suitable replacements, but if somehow you jammed one in there, you know, that shouldn't work. Um, Topic Mapper has a constraints check, and it'll say, like, hey, this broker is going to fail in these following ISRs. You can't use it. Sorry. The idea of this is that it's supposed to be dummy proof. Um, anybody should be able to run these repairs and eventually anybody is just gonna be a computer. Scaling pools, this is where capacity planning really comes into play. So when do we do this? We do it when 90% storage utilization is forecasted within 48 hours, typically. This is kind of a baseline, it's not true everywhere. So the way this works is actually pretty nice. Um, we add brokers to the pool and we run a rebalance. Everything previously described about doing rebalancing it's actually the same process for scaling. Oh, I'm sorry. It's weird. It's computers. So, yeah, scaling pools is, uh, like I was saying, it's really the same as a rebalance. The only difference is that we're adding additional brokers to the pool. 
So when we do this, um, like I was saying, it results in a reassignment file that we apply. And we're doing this quite often, whether it's for recoveries or scaling. Um, another service, and this is part of the Kafka Kid um, you know, repository, it's called Autothrottle. It's a standalone service and it takes over every single time that you do an assignment. I'm sure that you guys probably use um, you know, the, the recovery throttles. If you do, it's, it's a good thing to have so you don't belie your consumers. Um, one thing I found is that you know, we were watching this and uh, you'd want to set the recovery throttle higher and then you'd be like, oh, there's a new consumer workload or it ramped up, I need to back the throttle off. The idea of a human doing this just wasn't great, so we created a service to do it. I guess this stopped working now. Oh. Cool. So Autothrottle is a service that dynamically manages the replication rates, it uses Datadog metrics, and what it does is actually looking at the throughput on all of the brokers and dynamically adapting to the consumer load. Uh, the idea of it is to run replications as fast as possible without affecting consumers. Um, it's got a pretty smart mechanism where it always leaves a little bit of headroom and the idea of that is so there's space for consumers to ramp up a little bit. And what happens is it's checking every so many minutes. And if it sees that that headroom is being eaten into a little more, that means consumers are probably possibly wanting more you know, network. So auto throttle will back off the throttle a little bit. Another thing that happens is that when you apply a throttle, it'll actually remain on the brokers and you have to do this verified maps thing at the end to remove the throttle. Uh, Auto throttle does this for you. Um, you kind of see in this nifty background I did, it's, it's shooting Datadog events and kind of telling you what it's doing along the way. When the actual replication is done, it automatically removes the throttles for you. Because scaling actually uses the same internal mechanics as rebalancing, when you increase capacity, you also improve storage balance. So this graph is a single, um, you know, single one of our pools being scaled up. You can see the series at the bottom, that's about five or 10 brokers or so that are, you know, took on partitions from the most heavily loaded brokers and they're catching up. And you can see once they're in sync that the spread of the storage utilization was also brought back closer to the mean. So what's next? This was probably the quickest summary I can give of the last two and a half years. So everything described here is actually a series of a lot of robust primitives that are ripe for automation. The idea here is that most of this was initially to increase leverage. So to run larger and larger data store footprints with a small number of employees. We only have two people dedicated for this Kafka footprint that I mentioned. And part of the reason we are able to get away with this is high leverage tooling and simple scaling patterns. But where this needs to go next is humans no longer thinking about the capacity of pools or responding to alerts, but machines actually doing it themselves. So for one example would be a service that might monitor capacity among pools and automatically move topics among them. Uh, it might do something like expand the capacity of a pool if needed. Also continued growth and dozens of more clusters, like I mentioned, everything that, you know, any numbers that I gave today, it's probably gonna be outdated in 10 months. We're also using new infrastructure. Uh, previously mentioned a uh, talk given here by one of my colleagues, Baltazar. Uh, it's really good, you should Google it. This is about running all of our infrastructure on Kubernetes. So this is a new challenge that we have. And subsequently, that means we're hiring, building all this stuff out, supporting dozens of more clusters, petabyte scale growth that just continues to ramp up. Uh, there's obviously a need for talent. So if this is something you're interested in, you could also DM me as well. And that's all I have. Thank you. Questions? Back there. How did you uh, come up with those MTTR rates and such? Like, how did you actually come about those numbers? How did they, yeah. Yeah, this was, this was kind of thumb to the wind. So with the original, you know, machine spec that we were using, uh, you know, initially it was like the, the recovery times were tolerable. What we found with scale is that obviously as you throw more machines into a cluster, the larger it gets, the more frequently you're going to have failures. Um, so when you have, you know, a 1.6 petabyte Kafka cluster, that means it's probably under constant failure. One of the problems described is that you can only do one recovery at a time. So you kind of have different ways of going about this. One is more clusters. The other is lower MTTRs. 
Uh, we like to kind of use a balance of both, um, but lowering the MTTR was super important because we just found like more and more frequently you'd have a failure going and then another failure rolls in and it's blocked by the first one. So getting it from, you know, 15 hours down to two hours was clearly good. Oh, you've got one behind you. So uh, what tools did you use to uh, figure out if there was something wrong with your setup? I mean, did you do it against your production environment or uh, any other environment? I mean, what was the methodology? Yeah. Yeah. So if I caught the question was, uh, how do we spot like problems with the general configuration? The tools that you use to, uh... Oh, how do we spot tools? Yeah, so there's, um, it's getting to the point that I do have to have automated like correctness testing. Uh, but for the most part, you know, it's, there's everything that I write, you know, the crit criticality of the service is pretty high. So there's a low tolerance for messing up. Um, it's pretty extensive tests and I also manually test it. There's some things that I run offline to ensure that it's making the right decisions. So, um, you know, not breaking placement constraints, like I said, is, is like a huge one. There was a really obscure bug that I had that I caught, you know, right before it was released that where in rebalancing it allowed duplicates in the, uh, the ISR. So that was obviously bad, but yeah, extensive testing, just general good code hygiene, care about it like a critical service that it is. Right there. Um, this is, sold as client facing uh, a solution or it's packaged to yeah so this is uh it's written in go and it's a binary so it's easy to use um go to the datadog github and you'll see it the entire repo is called kafka kit you can pull it down and you should have everything that you need to go and i have a, a question about the um as you go through a capacity uh exercise like mm -hmm. whether it's a bank or a large uh configuration environment you'd want to be able to um, prioritize uh, the application um, or the components that would be critical within the topics that are part of your core application. Is there any uh, intent to kind of create more of a business transaction processing or TP processing kind of monitoring component to it so that you can determine, you know, what the priority topics are? Because obviously if you have a cluster this complex, constantly um, re self-regenerating. Uh, you don't have a lot of uh, control over the prioritization, especially in, if you look at how an architecture like this would be leveraged in, let's say, a traditional company, not a web company, right. where this would be by division, by business unit, et cetera. So you know, you'd want to be able to chunk it by cost, by structure, by application, by feature. Okay. Yeah. So that assuming, yeah, assuming I understand that correctly, one of, uh, this is kind of the concept of having the pools that I talked about. One of the, the functions of a pool is that's your, your level of isolation that you have. So you can take topics and a critical topic might be the only occupant inside of a pool. So that's like absolutely what we do. Um, so if you do this like from scratch, that seems like an intuitive solution. It's like, oh, we have this really sensitive topic. Let's throw it on dedicated brokers. Um, then you start realizing all the problems that I described, like, oh, how do you get utilization high though, right? If you threw a topic on dedicated brokers every time, you get low utilization. So the idea for us was to pack together as many as you can on, on broker pools. And broker pools might come in prefix sizes, so like 32 brokers. Let's start piling it up till it's at utilization. And along the way, Topic Mapper is ensuring balance. Um, one interesting property with Kafka is that because the storage consumption is bound, you know, to the to the data rate of the topic itself, doing storage balance also gives you network throughput balance as well. So um, that times, you know, using the quote unquote bandwidth monster instances, we just find that there's so much bandwidth for the consumers, generally not a problem. Great, thank you. But yeah, at some point having more sophisticated, you know, topic placement is definitely something I wanna keep in mind. I just, it's not a problem that we face yet.